right now we're going to get into learning some more about structural violence, which actually leads right into um, right from what we just uh, discussed in Dr. Blackstock's uh, keynote speech. Um, so officially welcome everybody to structural violence. Um, before we begin, here are some quick logistics. This session will consist of a 45 minute presentation with five minutes of questions. After 45 minutes, our chat monitor will read questions from the chat and we'll call on those with their hands raised. Um, but I was previously just speaking to Dr. Garden and she is actually more um, than willing to have more time for questions so folks can have a back and forth about this topic. So uh, due to time constraints, we may only have time for one to two questions, but of course we're hoping for more. Um, at 2.35 p.m., the session will end. You may then navigate to session D presentations, which will begin at 2.50, so you'll have a little bit of a break. Um, and now I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Rebecca Garden, Associate Professor of Public Health and Preventative Medicine at SUNY Upstate Medical University. Dr. Garden, you may now have the floor. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Great, thank you. So I wanna begin by acknowledging and thanking everyone involved in organizing this amazing conference, uh, especially the conference chairs, chairs Isabel Thanord Lewis, Samantha Williams and Angelina Ellis. I am not exaggerating when I say this is one of my, the greatest honors of my career to be invited to present at this conference, which I just think is astonishing in its quality and, uh, and how timely it is. And among other things, um, uh, you know, they, these conference chairs have worked really hard to learn about what it takes to make digital space inclusive and representative of disabled and deaf people by making sure that there are interpreters and captioning and that the presenters are providing alt text on our images and, our, and, and access copies of our slideshows. So this is a fundamental step toward health justice that's all too often overlooked. I also want to acknowledge some critical disjunctures um, involved in this pre presentation. So one is in regard to place. So despite the fact that this talk is taking place in digital space, it's very much rooted in the heart of Syracuse, New York. So I wanna begin in regards to place. I acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee on whose ancestral lands Upstate Medical University now stands. I acknowledge with res respect the Black community on whose former neighborhood, the 15th Ward, Upstate Medical University now stands. So our healthcare center, our place of learning and healing is also a place of dislocation and harm. This is a starting point for this lecture on structural violence. The second site of disjuncture is my role, and my, some might say my presumption, in claiming expertise in matters of structural violence, environmental just, injustice, and health disparities, given my positionality. So I want to acknowledge that I have a great deal of privilege as a white cisgender settler colonial and middle class person. And although I live with the fallout of intergenerational trauma and related mental health and health issues, I don't identify as disabled. <clears throat> structural violence is not a, not a metaphor. The term structural violence is a tool that helps us to reveal the way that inequalities harm bodies and minds. Inequalities have a material impact on our health they cause disease and death. And that's really what this entire conference has provided an enormous amount of data and research to prove. Structural inequalities are caused by both private actions and institutional policies, by racism, ableism, and other forms of bias and discrimination, and by social and political phenomena like pollution, poverty, and lack of access to good education, safe housing, and fair employment, fair employment, all of which are impacted by individual actions, by planning and decision making. Structural inequalities impact bodies and minds, whether they manifest as stress or trauma, or whether they deny certain kinds of people access to health care, good homes that build equity and financial security, good quality and delicious food, and beautiful places for exercise and enjoyment. 
structural inequalities impair and impede the opportunity for a good life and flourishing. So consider what we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic. Nursing home workers who care for residents are grossly underpaid. The situation is caused by individual actions and a failure of policy to protect and provide a decent wage for the critical labor of these healthcare providers who are predominantly women of color. They care for some of the most vulnerable in our society and yet are denied a wage and other benefits that it will, would allow them to live in safety and security, let alone comfort. As we've seen in other disasters, such as nursing home residents abandoned in the rising floodwaters of Hurricane Harvey in 2017, our policies favor nursing home investors, CEOs and administrators, rather than the people who provide direct care or even the residents themselves. Direct care workers have to take on second jobs to make ends meet. Studies suggest that this is one cause of the tragically high rate of transmission of COVID-19 in nursing homes. As Dill, D-I-L-L -L, and colleagues, the authors of a health affairs blog post explain, the healthcare sector workforce is racialized in that black indigenous and people of color are concentrated in female dominated direct care and reproductive occupations. Occupations that reflect our historic dependence on women of color and especially black women to perform the dirty work in domestic spaces as slaves, servants and low wage workers. Structural violence is not a metaphor. The actions or inaction of individuals in tandem with policy or the lack of policy combine to cause disease, disability, and death. Structural violence is what Paul Farmer and his col colleagues call the social arrangements that put individuals and populations at risk of harm. In their words, the quote, arrangements are structural because they're embedded in the political and economic organization of our social world. They are violent because they cause injury to people typically not those responsible for perpetuating such inequalities, close quote. These social arrangements are so deeply embedded in our history and so prevalent in our society that they have been naturalized and normalized, at least for those who benefit rather than suffer from them. We must use tools to denaturalize and reveal these forces and actions. The term structural violence in itself suggests that we recognize that there are actors as well as serious outcomes. The concept of structural violence is a tool just like the other diagnostic and therapeutic tools necessary to provide good healthcare. It's a form of critical consciousness that can help us to see what others might not see and to reveal these arrangements and processes to others as a first step to change. If you're just beginning to learn about these histories and the ways in which you may have benefited from structurally violent policies and practices, you may be struggling to understand what you can do to make change, to repair the harm. Knowledge is power and you can teach others about what you learn. The next step of course is action, whether it involves making changes to the policies where you work or advocating for policy change at the state or national level. We can use the concept of structural violence to better understand and to treat racialized health disparities by understanding the history of racialized space in the communities where we live. I'm going to talk about the history of the repeated disruption and di dislocation of the black community in Syracuse. And this is one piece of the kind of structural competence, competency that Dr. Blackstock was just describing. Much of the discussion that follows reflects the work done by environmental justice scholar Keisha Aminashan Ducree in her book called A Place We Call Home, Gender, Place, and Justice in Syracuse. This history is not unique to Syracuse. It's the history of other Rust Belt cities in New York State like Rochester and Buffalo. It's the history of my hometown, Detroit, and other Midwest post-industrial cities. It's the history of inner ring suburbs like Ferguson and what we've called inner cities in places like Baltimore. 
These histories of structural violence impact health and healthcare, but they are not widely taught in health education curricula, if at all. And maybe that's something we can talk about during the Q&A. Structural violence is not a metaphor and it's not only a historical artifact. As sociologist Paul Jargowski observes in his report called Architecture of Segregation, quote, we are witnessing a nationwide return of concentrated poverty that is racial in nature and that this expansion and continued existence of high poverty ghettos and barrios is no accident. These neighborhoods are not the value-free outcomes of the impartial workings of the housing market. <clears throat> Rather in large measure, they're an, an inevitable and predictable consequences of deliberate policy choices, close quote. We need to learn from the past in order to eradicate racism from our policymaking processes in the present. African-Americans began to settle in Syracuse in the 18th century. They worked on the Erie Canal in the 19th century, but they did not share in the economic prosperity brought by the canal system. Instead, they were segregated by occupation and restricted to doing domestic and service work, as well as being segregated residentially. By the 1940s, when African-Americans were relocating to Syracuse as part of the Great Northern Migration, Black Syracusans had already been subject to displacement and dislocation from their homes in the Washington and Water Strip neighborhood. <clears throat> According to Keisha Ducre, in the 1930s, quote, city leaders declared the area a slum and issued orders to demolish many of the houses along Washington Water Strip. It might be helpful to pause for a second here on the question of agency. Who was responsible for this act of structural violence? The city leaders, the policymakers were responsible, but we must also consider how, as sociologists Massey, M-A-S-S-E-Y, and Denton, D-E-N-T-O-N, argue, racial residential segrega segregation was the result of, quote, actions and practices that had the passive acceptance, if not the active support, of most whites in the United States. So if we benefit from policy that harms others and we don't do anything to address that inequality, then we're part of the problem of structural violence. So in the 1930s, white city leaders with the tacit or active support of other white citizens displaced and dislocated black Syracusans who then moved into the 15th ward which was already stressed in terms of population density and aging housing. At the same time, there was a housing program as part of the New Deal that was mapping cities to determine how best to help people by providing low interest loans so they could buy their own homes. So we've heard about this from Dr. Blackstock's talk. This is the history of the Homeowners Loan Corporation and the mapping project is called redlining but you might not be familiar with these details in regard to Syracuse. So I hope it can be helpful for you to go more deeply into these specific social arrangements. And on the screen, you'll see two maps. They're the same map. So the one on the right is the historic map and the one on the left is a modernized version that makes it just a little bit easier to read. In the 1930s, the government sponsored homeowners loan corporation first drafted maps of American communities to determine which ones were worthy of mortgage lending. Surveyors were directed to go into the field and to look for what was categorized on the government forms as quote, infiltration of undesirable elements. The program gave neighborhoods with black and ethnic re residents a D grade and colored them red on the map. Banks based their lending practices on these maps and refused to give loans to people in the D grade red line neighborhoods. Those marked with an A grade, which are marked in green, were given loans in the full amount with low interest rates and uh, low down payments. These were color, um, there were color coded uh, B and C grade areas as well. As ta Coates puts it, quote, Redlining destroyed the possibility of investment wherever Black people lived, close quote. These communities were segregated by a lack of investment. The homes, businesses, and communities lost their value and thus deteriorated. 
the areas in red on the Syracuse map include the near west side and a neighborhood that was on the southeast edge of downtown known as, as the 15th Ward, which was home to a large number of African Americans. This is where Upstate Medical University now stands. The yellow areas were considered subject to, quote, infiltration of a lower grade population. The south and west sides of Syracuse, as well as part of the north side, were marked in yellow. The people who lived in these communities, Jews, Italians, and Eastern Europeans, were considered to be a, quote, lower grade population. This means that they were not white Americans, at least not yet. The A grade areas where upper class people were settling during the time of this mapping project are, are areas that would become the suburbs of Syracuse, the white suburbs of Syracuse. This is how whiteness is defined and how race is constructed, how racism is perpetuated through deliberate policy decisions. So I wanna take a little detour to Detroit here and to my own story. I have needed to understand how I have benefited from the racialization of space and place and from what some researchers call American apartheid. I grew up in an all white suburb of Detroit, just one block from the city line where working class folks were making their way into the middle class. All of my grandparents came to the US for a better life. One of them jumped sh ship and swam ashore in New York Harbor rather than go through Ellis Island. My grandpa, Dominic Primzich, swam ashore and changed his last name to Hubner and passed as a German because at that time, Central and European, Eastern European immigrants were the targets of violence. So one of my grandfathers was not only an illegal immigrant, he was also not fully white until he jumped off that boat and swam ashore so that he could rename himself and redefine himself as German and thus avoid being discriminated against. After that, he was passing for white or something whiter than he was. And obviously this option depended upon optics and other cultural factors. But after a single generation, my family was white. They were poor whites, however. All of my grandparents and my parents were dirt poor during the depression. My dad was a high school dropout. He lied about his age and he joined the Air Force just before the war ended. He never saw action, never learned to be a pilot like he wanted to, but he did qualify for the GI Bill, which once he passed the GED, paid for his college and graduate school education. He became a teacher, then a school administrator. He was given an FHA loan and bought his growing family a home in the city of Detroit. And then he relocated his family to the new white suburbs. This is at least on the surface, an American su success story, a Horatio Alger story. <clears throat> However, not everyone had access to these benefits, these federally funded financial and social advantages that would make such a profound material impact on my family including the material of our bodies and health. So yeah, my dad worked really hard, but he was given a ladder to climb up out of poverty and into the middle class. The question I have to grapple with is whether that ladder was made of the bodies of black, brown, and indigenous people. People of color were den denied access to the benefits of the GI Bill and FHA loans. The middle class status that I now enjoy, my education, my access to safe housing, and my job opportunities come at the expense of others. And the higher rates of disease and death that we see in Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities today are part, due in part to extreme racial inequalities in overall wealth, which are due in part to a systematic exclusion from accruing wealth through home ownership. So Dr. Blackstock laid all this out, but this is just a little bit um, of evidence on the screen here in a chart. And I'll just add that because I think this part of the story might be helpful for some to know, I want to add that I left home at 17 and I wasn't in contact with my parents for some time. 
It was not a safe family to be in, so I left it. I lived the rest of my life completely on my own financially and often without much contact with my family. I was a serial college dropout for years. I lived in tenements in impoverished neighborhoods in Detroit and then in New York City. I was robbed and I saw drive-bys and other forms of community violence. But the minute that I had the financial capacity to move into a safer neighborhood, I could because I am white. This was not the case for my coworkers in various jobs, black women who made better incomes than I did, but would be denied housing in safer neighborhoods again and again because of their race. I add this part of the story because I want students and colleagues to know that some of us get to where we are professionally by circuitous routes and while navigating histories of trauma, illness, and disability. I also want to illustrate how I fell back down the ladder that my father had climbed up, but I was able to climb back up again so quickly because of my privilege and because of systemic racism. If I'm going to go beyond complicity and passive acceptance of systemic racism, I need to study my own history as well as the history of my adopted city to know how black and brown and indigenous folks have been systematically denied the benefits and opportunities of my American dream. I need to tell that part of the story. This is just the very first step of reparations. So let's return to Syracuse, to the Black and ethnic Townsend Street neighborhood to better understand the development of this, quote, American apartheid. In order to understand the specific mechanisms of racialized residential segregation in the US by looking at Syracuse, Keisha Ducree quotes specifically what a surveyor wrote on a loan corporation form about the Townsend Street zone, which was home to black Syracusans, as well as those deemed non-white non at the time. Quote, a very old and quite congested section of the city containing everything from singles to tenements. All are in rather poor condition and display no pride of ownership. Inhabitants, largely Semitic and Negro, are of an undesirable laboring type." Close quote. Ducree's close reading of a historical document helps us to understand how structural violence is naturalized, how it's made to seem like the right thing to do. People living in this neighborhood are labeled as undesirable and are described as lacking pride in ownership. What does it mean to be labeled undesirable? How does this impact a life, one's health and well-being? Even the fact of one's employment status, being working class, describes the type of person this is, a laboring type. This is the process of naturalization. This is the process of the biologization of what are in fact social arrangements. These descriptors serve the rationalization for further neglecting and ultimately destroying a neighborhood. One former resident of the 15th Ward, Luana, Will I'm sorry, Luana Adams, described what it felt like to be undesirable. She says, quote, when I first came here, it was just as bad as it was in Georgia. Here, the color li colored lived nowhere but in the colored town, and they didn't want you no place, close quote. Despite being unwanted, forced to live in, quote, no place, the Black community made a place for itself in Syracuse. O.T. Scruggs, Scruggs, so it's O-T-E-Y, Scruggs, an African-American professor of history at Syracuse University who passed away in 2014, said this about living in the 15th Ward before the civil rights era of the 1960s. Quote, the ward was a refuge from discrimination. Social cohesion was provided by clubs, churches, and the Dunbar Center the most prominent community institution. But most of all, the ties that bound rested on the camaraderie that blossomed from knowing virtually everyone in the community." Close quote. 
Shortly after the Townsend Street and the Washington Water Strip neighborhoods were demolished and displaced residents had relocated in the 15th Ward, the Housing Authority began planning dem demolitions there too. Ducree says, quote, the city's bulldozers seem to follow black Syracusans. So part of the Townsend Street uh, neighborhood was cleared to enable the construction of the Pioneer Homes Public Housing Complex, which is located on the other side of Interstate 81 from the main campus of Upstate Medical University. And here I'm gonna quote um, a key passage from Ducree's book. And she starts out by talking about Mindy, M-I-N-D-Y, full of love, F-U-L-L-I-L-O-V-E, who's a social psychiatrist who works on urban policy and public health. I recommend her work. She has lots of amazing talks available as videos on YouTube. So quote, Mindy Fuller Love estimates that approximately 1600 African-American communities were bulldozed under the auspices of urban renewal programs. She describes the pain of destruction on both black individuals and the black community in the United States overall as root shock, a prolonged stress reaction to the disruption of one's environment or emotional ecosystem. Syracuse's urban renewal program displaced nearly 1300 people, predominantly black residences and small businesses in the 15th ward to make way for civ civic projects. Beginning in the 1950s, federal funds leverage downtown development that can still be seen today. The Everson Museum of Art, Upstate Medical Center, the Presidential Plaza Project for Middle Class Housing, the City Police Station, and two parking lots, close quote. Urban Renewal also demolished the 15th Ward in order to build Interstate 81. Again, city officials disguised the dislocation of the neighborhood with the euphemism slum clearance. Congress approved and funded highway construction and urban renewal policies. City officials saw this as an opportunity to increase the size of the city by opening up interstate and community commuting access. By 1960, almost 8,000 African-Americans lived in the 15th Ward and many of the residents, most of them homeowners, objected to its destruction to make way for the highway. Some advocated for confrontation, others for collaboration. Residents were always at risk of alienating those who held power over them. Despite their protests, arguments, and pleas, city officials raised Black homes, businesses, and parks without plans for relocation of the residents. Most of the former homeowners were forced to rent in under-resourced neighborhoods, now the South Side and the Near West Side, without compensation for lost property or their lost investment in home wealth, which led to a loss in overall wealth. This process resulted in deeper racial segregation and the concentration of what sociologist Paul Jargowski, J-A-R-G-O-W-S-K-Y, calls extreme poverty in these neighborhoods. All of this has an impact on health and well-being of people of color, including Native Americans and Latinx, and people with disabilities, whether higher rates of disease, disability, injuries, or mental health issues. Structural violence is not a metaphor. Like many cities in the United States, Syracuse is struggling with community violence. People may be able to see structural violence more clearly now when they see regular posting of videos attesting to a long history of police brutality and extrajudicial executions, and when they see the disproportionate numbers of Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people sick and dying from COVID. We also need to think about structural violence in relation to community violence and to shift our focus to encompass the underlying and upstream con contributors to that violence. So this is where we get to the part where we can open the discussion. What can we do to get to health justice? What can we do? Keisha Ducree says, injustice can be understood as a process 
to diminish or compress space like racial residential se segregation, while justice is seen as a liberatory act that frees marginalized identities from oppressive spaces. So how do we engage in these liberatory acts? Obviously, this entire conference is a big, beautiful toolkit, but I want to emphasize that um, something that quickly gets lost in the process. We have to be inclusive to achieve real representation, and that is something I feel like this conference has demonstrated. Our institutions and their bureaucracies and their logics make it extremely hard to be inclusive. It takes time and resources to be inclusive. It takes a commitment from the very moment that you begin planning a new project or initiative or think about writing for a grant. It involves building relationships and networking with those to understand who's falling through the cracks of an extremely cracked healthcare system and, and public health system and how to include them in problem solving from stopgap measures to ripping it all out and building the system anew with inclusive design principles. This means recognizing that the knowledge of, your, of patients and communities may be more important or at least as important as your knowledge and expertise. Another suggestion is to ask for help. Ask for help from other professions and other disciplines, as well as from communities. Social scientists and humanities scholars, as well as artists, writers, and de designers have been training our whole lives to help clinicians and scientists to understand the social and cultural dimensions of health. And a gentle uh, interrogation that I wanna begin for this conference is, is it physician centric and if so why and is there a way that we can do more to make it interprofessional and that's like a gesture toward liberation not not a critique another suggestion um, is to commit to learning and people have been saying this all along it's about lifelong learning and i feel like some of us have to take more responsibility about doing our homework. Um, so this is really to my white colleagues um, and, and to students, to those who claim to be allies. Become a student of what bioethicist Keisha Ray calls black bioethics. Quote, black bioethics examines the events, actions, and policies that affect black health. And we also need to extend this to other marginalized groups and identities. And just um, for the interpreter, I'm going to spell out um, Keisha Ray's name, K-E-I-S-H-A-R-A-Y. And then commit to act. Start in your own institution calling for a disability access policy or a policy that recognizes the inv often invisible diversity tax or find your sliding scale approaches to making change. Um, and there were so many amazing suggestions um, and I don't need to go into them from the earlier panels. Um, but it's really about balancing your own mental health and your own well being um, with um, your commitment to justice. And sometimes that advocacy can feed your well being. And other times, um, this is the institutional accountability piece from cultural humility. A lot of times I feel like institutions want to offload onto students the responsibility for wellness or for, you know, solving the problems of diversity. So I just want to say um, you can also call on, you know, uh, tenured faculty, you know, people who have more power than you to do the work. Um, and I mean work. Um, so I'll just I'll just wrap it up there and open now to discussion. Oops. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Garden. Um, now I see that we have a question in the chat, so Vanessa is going to take over and then just ask you the question. Okay. Hi, Dr. Garden. Thank you so much for speaking to us about structural violence. Um, Mike Pollack asks, given the intertwined nature of history and health outcomes in Syracuse and central New York, should the university be taking a stance on local issues like the debate over the Columbus statue and the I-81 and making that stance known to the community? That's an excellent question. <clears throat> um, so there's policy that I've had to learn as a faculty member 
<clears throat> so we are part of the SUNY system, the State University of New York. We are state employees. Um, and we are prohibited from engaging in political activity. And I feel like that has become a kind of smokescreen that has made um, political and moral action very challenging for me as a faculty member, where there have been times that I have taken positions on what I feel is a, a situation of moral concern and where I feel like political action is, is ethical action, right? And a lot of times we are talking about policies that are related to administrations or political figures that we see as seriously unethical, seriously unjust. But I, we, it's possible to get pushback <laughs> from administrators or other faculty and I don't know if they misunderstand or if that policy is open to interpretation but there's a significant amount of pushback around taking specific positions so a lot of times students and I'm not sure Mike Pollock if you're a student or a faculty member but students have the freedom to do protests for example on campus that I as a faculty member could not do and so you, you, you might be able to work in tandem with faculty. Faculty can guide and support, but not necessarily represent positions that you can take. But I, as a faculty member, have pushed really hard against these kinds of restrictions. And we've seen certain things like, you know, um, I was really surprised when Upstate organized a Black Lives Matter contingent to go to a Black Lives Matter protest, where I think in the past that would not, you know, if, if I had worn an Upstate t-shirt to Black Lives Matter protest, um, that would not have gone well. So um, I think that is just to say that these are negotiable um, kind of policy and ethical issues. And to me, it's important to keep educating people because they get scared about getting in trouble, right? You know, this is, this could be considered unprofessional. This could be, uh, it could affect your tenure case, your promotion, your job security. You have to figure out the best way to frame your argument to be able to push back. And, and that's just going to be an ongoing process that I'm sure you guys are already engaged in. Thank you so much. Um, I have another question from Sydney Good. Um, they asked, it seems like historically white populations have been able to get away with whatever radical or violent changes they wanted because history has a way of erasing the origins of structural violence over time. However, when marginalized groups attempt to make change, it's too radical. How can marginalized communities enact possibly radical, radically, change and benefit the history's ability to normalize these changes over time? Yeah, I think, you know, that's such a great and difficult question that I feel so incapable of answering <laughs> ultimately. But I, I think that it's again, um, beholden on those of us who are taking up the space with our power and privilege to very strategically hold that space and get out of the way. Like I really want to be a placeholder until um, you know someone who is the right person to be telling this history um, takes my place. In, so it, for example, in my institution in Upstate, and I think that these histories need to be told by the people who are most affected by them and living them. I feel like there's something fundamentally um, problematic about the fact that uh, in giving this presentation, you know, I am objectifying people of color by saying they, them. You know, if, 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 Keisha, if Keisha Decree were giving this talk, it would be we, us. Um, so that's why it was so important for me to figure out how to begin to model to other white faculty what it means to be accountable for my history of privilege and my, my complicity, my passive acceptance, my role. But it really is about 
again, um, people doing their homework and, you know, we've had so many amazing bibliographies shared. We've had so many opportunities to learn. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's just about, you know, making space for that, um, those, those histories to come through. Thank you so much. I think we have time for another, maybe one or two questions. Um, we have one from Maria Dalzell who asked, on the note of reparations, how can institutions, for example, um, their university, acknowledge and repay the communities they displaced for their buildings or businesses? So thank you for picking up on that, where I deliberately use the term reparations. I think there's so much that we as an institution can do in that regard. And um, I think people in the past have been afraid of the concept of reparations. You know, when ta Coates uh, st first started, published his case for reparations, was that like six years ago? You know, um, it seemed outlandish. I think it's, it's just, outlandish that we aren't addressing that now. And it can begin with a conversation. It can begin with recognition, with acknowledgements. Uh, and then I think it does have to translate into, all right, we have all of these people. If we look at the representation of, of you know, um, race and ethnicity, for example, on upstate faculty, all these people are benefiting from the resources that are provided by upstate um, how can we begin to leverage that toward justice? So I think we have to start with conversations about, about land and space and resources in the Syracuse community. And, you know, I know this is a time of austerity because of COVID, but when is it not a time of austerity? When are we not in crisis as an institution? And what is our crisis as an institution in comparison with you know, the crisis that people are facing who are just trying to survive you know, the pandemic? So I feel like there are so many ways we can begin this process of reparations and that it needs to be a, a conversation that's guided by humility where we would then go to the community members, you know, and stakeholders who are, you know, our nearest neighbors, just starting with that and say, what would re reparations look like, you know, to you? And, and that would be such a powerful learning experience and opportunity to, um, to make up for the past. So um, I think we should start, you know, really moving that conversation forward in some way. Thank you for that. Um, we have another question from Sam Hamid. They asked, um, any recommendations to push for greater change within our own institutions when we feel our calls to action are always sidelines? I have seen many institutions respond to student calls for change via town halls, which often feel like they exist just to give us a space to talk, feel like they did something and then no follow through. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Um, it's, um, I feel like asking students to come to another town hall or be on another committee, or would you review the curriculum for us and tell us where you see the, you know, systemic racism, that's just offloading the work of the institution onto the student who should just be able to be a student. And I don't wanna disempower anyone and exclude anyone's voice from that conversation, those conversations and those processes. But the, you know that needs to be said. And again, it's like, it's beholden of faculty members like I am who have the security of tenure to be the ones saying this, that this is not right. So, you know, one thing I'll say is there are faculty governance organizations within your institution. So at Upstate, we have the College of Medicine um, Executive Committee, the General Assembly for Health Professions in the Library and the College of Nursing. There, uh, there's faculty council. These are organizations that should be predicated on um, uh, principles of shared governance in a way that they could really hear um, 
I hope, hear the concerns of students and signal boost them and, and really take them up because those bodies really are concerned with, um, with the affairs of, of education. And these are really critical to your education. Um, and, and really when we talk about like, how do we address um, health disparities and health inequalities, so much of that needs to come through changes to education. So um, that's just one suggestion. And I don't, you know, feel free to, anybody can contact me over email for more ideas. I think there's ways that you can find a little piece of policy to put through, like the acknowledgements I had at the beginning of this, of this um, presentation. What would it mean to say, okay, as an outcome of this conference, and I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to <laughs> be presumptuous about what the or organizers want to do, what would it mean to say, okay, from now on, we need to have a land acknowledgement um, and an acknowledgement of the communities that were displaced. Thank you so much, Dr. Garden. Um, we actually have five minutes left. So if anybody wants to drop another question in the chat or even just use um, the hand, I'm sorry, the reaction in order to reaction button at the bottom of your screen, in order to raise your hand, um, you can be unmuted to ask a question to Dr. Garden uh, directly. And I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows about um, Dr. Susan Moore, um, to whom this talk is dedicated. Um, and you know, I feel like most of you know about this, but I just wanted to get this up there. And um, this is just an image that I wasn't able to work into the talk which is um, an image that an employee of Upstate shared with me when I first started doing um, like working group discussions with um, students, faculty and staff around structural violence in Syracuse and talking about the, uh, the 15th Ward. Um, this is just an image from the, you know, what was then the Syracuse newspaper before the demolition of the 15th Ward that recognizes that you know the city pool that was in the park that was demolished was a place of um, you know kind of like profound spiritual importance where baptisms were taking place. Um, so I just wanted to share those images um, since we had the time. Thank you so much, Dr. Garden, for sharing all this information. Um, as somebody who Student at Upstate, I always love learning more about Syracuse and learning more about the history because we definitely don't get to talk about it enough. So thank you so, so much. Um, everybody, um, again, Dr. Garden's um, contact information is on the screen. If anybody wants to take a moment to jot that down, um, I'm sure Dr. Garden would be more than willing to answer any additional questions or thoughts that anybody might have. Again, thank you so much to our interpreters. Thank you so much to you, Dr. Garden. Um, and thank you so much for everybody for coming. So we'll see you in the next session. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.